Today on Let's Talk Crimes, we want to learn a little bit about, you know, self-defense. When when can I actually even use this as an argument? I know this is super controversial, and we even see it on all the TV shows. So Frank, tell us a little bit about uh, self-defense. <laughs> Frank, tell us a little bit about uh, self-defense. Self-defense is is a great a great topic. First, let me introduce myself again. I like to do it every single episode. Welcome to Let's Talk Crimes. Remember, this is a sit back, conversational uh, atmosphere. And today's question is self-defense. Self-defense. I'm gonna say uh, the non-legal form, and then and then I'll get into law. But practically, it means that there are times under the law that you're justified in using force against someone. The uh, general language of the law is that a person can use force against someone else if that person thinks that force is going to be used against them. Imminently. That's a big, a big word. Imminently is the key word. You have to believe that the other person is going to use force against you right now. What, how much force can you use? This is where the language gets tricky. You can use non-deadly force if you think that non-deadly force is gonna be used against you. You cannot use deadly force if you think that non-deadly force is gonna be used against you. If somebody's angry coming towards you and he has nothing in his hands, it doesn't mean you can always take out a gun and shoot that person. You have to feel that you are reasonably in danger of deadly force to use deadly force. So if you don't think he's going to use deadly force, you don't get to use deadly force. If you believe that you're in imminent danger, that somebody's going to use deadly force against you, which is first force that can reasonably kill you, then the law says you're justified in using the ultimate, which is deadly force. What applies to both of those scenarios is that you do not have a duty to retreat. You don't have to leave. And this is what, what has changed. In 2005, uh, that became law in the state of Florida. And most people know it as the stand your ground law. You can stand your ground. You don't have a duty to retreat. Before 2005, you did. As a matter of fact, many people don't understand this. The state of Florida is the first state in the entire nation to come up with a stand your ground law. It says, guys, you don't have to retreat. Before that, you can only you can only use uh, deadly force or non-deadly force if they're using that type of force against you and you were not able to retreat because you were incapable of, but you, were so, you had a duty to try, not anymore. I hope that helped. No, it definitely helps. But I think, you know, of course the law, I don't know who wrote it, but I feel like there's a lot of gray area and kind of a lot of things that are up for interpretation, especially on the non-deadly force with non-deadly force. Because if, if let's say I'm a small, I'm a small guy, maybe five feet, you know, a hundred pounds and a large freaking six footer, 300 pounder comes at me. Could I use deadly force in maybe that situation? Because just the size difference is so big. And maybe he doesn't have a weapon, but it might be deadly just for me, just because... And you are correct. It is open for interpretation. It, and they use the word reasonable. If you're in reasonable, believe that it's deadly. So, obviously, that's going to be what an attorney will have to argue. Do you reasonably believe? And you're absolutely right. If, if I'm six foot, uh, three inches, 250 pounds, and, and perhaps a female... That, that is 5'2", 120 pounds, comes up to me with nothing in her hands, it's going to be very difficult for me to <laughs> prove or to show that I reasonably believe that she was going to kill me. Right. Now, vice versa, <laughs> that's a different story. So, absolutely, those are the things. That's why self-defense, I love self-defense. I've argued self-defense. I've won homicide cases in self-defense. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that it's, it's, it's difficult to argue but it works and when a person is justified, if it's presented well to the jury, a jury can easily understand the concept. All right. And I, I have another question for you. It might be a little off topic, but you know, if I, 
if I decided to use self-defense, let's say non-deadly, just because a man is attacking me, he's swinging his fist at me, and then the whole deal, they separate us and the police come, now, am I going to get arrested too? Or how do I even explain to the officer, hey, look, I was, I was fighting back in self-defense, or what happens in, in this situation? Witnesses, witnesses, witnesses. Uh, we hope that they would always exist, but they don't always exist. If you are in a situation that, that you, you, you know when you are in that situation, that you really did the right thing. And it came to the point that you just couldn't, you couldn't do it. You had to use force. Please, uh, if there's any way at one point that you can tell, please, somebody stay for the police officers because you're correct. When the police officer comes, he's probably going to arrest whoever seems to be the attacker. And mm -hmm. he, it's not that he's not going to listen to what you have to say. Chances are he's not going to be able to corroborate it because self-defense is a state of mind that you reasonably believe that you were in fear very difficult for police officers to know what your state of mind was unless there are many things that indicate it. So if you don't have witnesses, most of the times, unfortunately, you're going to get arrested. Right. Whoever looks like the attacker and the self-defense is going to come later. And, and stand your ground. I'm going to touch bases before I run out of time. Uh, let me tell you about reasonable belief. And, mm -hmm. and this is important to know. It used to be called the Castle Doctrine. Uh, when there was no stand your ground that you had a duty to read to read, that duty was treated differently if you were in your home. Now, remember, you only use force if you reasonably believe the force is going to be used against you. The law says that there is a presumption of reasonable fear in your home. Mm -hmm. When you are in your home, maybe now you're the six foot two inch guy in your home and you wake up at three in the morning, go to your refrigerator, and you find a five foot two inch female, the law says that you are presumed to be in fear because someone is in your home that doesn't belong there. So that doesn't mean guys, and I get this question, somebody comes to my house, can I shoot them? No, of course not. The law doesn't change. You have to be in reasonable belief that your life is in danger. It's just the law presumed that there is some fear if somebody is in your home and doesn't belong there. Right. Okay? Okay. Well, that's it. I, I hope you never have to use self-defense, but I think it's very important to understand what, what it is so that it won't be misused. And, and as always, it's been great talking to you guys. Don't let this program substitute your visit to your own attorney. This is not legal advice. You don't run out of here and argue these things in court. This is so that you get general information. When you're out there in the real life, I hope that you think about these conversations and that they help you. Have a great night. Right. What you gonna do when they come for